Please join me in welcoming the wonderful, incredibly intelligent, very challenging Laurie Penny to the Melbourne Writers' Festival stage today. Thank you. Thanks. Laurie Penny is a writer, journalist and author of three books. She writes for Vice, The Guardian and many other publications, is a columnist and contributing editor at the New Statesman magazine, and editor at large at, at, at cult New York literary project, The New Inquiry. At 23, she was the youngest person to be shortlisted for the Orwell Prize for political writing for her blog, Penny Red, which, like her first feminist book, Meat Market, Female Flesh Under Capitalism, was a word of mouth hit. Her other books are Penny Red, Notes from a New Age of Dissent, and Discordia, Six Nights in Crisis, Athens, and of course, Unspeakable Things. Laurie has reported on radical politics, protest, digital culture, and feminism from around the world, working with activists from the Occupy Movement and the European Youth Uprisings. Once again, please Thank give you. a big round of applause for Laurie. Thank you. Who has flown into Melbourne this morning from <laughs> London? It's so my what first day ever in Australia, so yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Thank well, you so come, much. You've for come coming. to the beautiful weather here. It's, it's like home. I love winter. I'm like, two winters, of course I will come to your festival. Yes. Well, I guess it's, you know, easy just to jump straight into mm -hmm. it. I mean, you name a book something like Unspeakable Things, and yeah. we'll be talking about unspeakable topics today. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the persistent silencing of women mm -hmm. and the effort put into coming up with new ways to keep women quiet. Your book is about the unspeakable things that women endure, but it's also a reference to the things that we're told we cannot say. What's the most dangerous and pervasive method you see being used to silence women today, and how can we push back against it? Well, I think dangerous and pervasive are different things, because obviously women and, and all kinds of people who suffer under uh, gender fascism and gender inequality are exposed to violence, and I think there is a big toll of violence that starts at school age for people who step outside perceived social norms. But I think if you're talking about pervasive, there is a huge trend in culture. And I think it's getting stronger and stronger as feminism makes more gains to say, you cannot behave in this way or you will not be loved. You will not be accepted. You won't have a family. You won't have friends. It's the expulsion and silencing and exclusion or at least the threat of that. And it's a very old thing, you know, the threat to women that if they don't behave right, they'll become old maids is uh, the classic Gosh, old version. Yes, I know. Yeah, the classic version of that. And you see that in the kind of feminists are ugly or don't date a feminist version of, uh, of the kind of modern silencing. And what I hear from a lot of young women who talk to me, are like people in their early teens is like, you know, I, I agree with the feminist ideas, but if I say I'm a feminist, you know, will I get a boyfriend? And it sounds, I mean, it's funny almost when you think about it, but actually it's very, it's chilling and sad because one of the things I was, uh, when I was sitting down to write the book, I was thinking, is that, okay, so there's the threat of violence, but in any movement of, any counter-oppressive movement or consciousness, you can when people are threatened with violence or have violence done to them, there's only so far an oppressive class can go before the people having the violence done to them say, no, hang on, this is not right, this is not okay, or at least acknowledge that something wrong is being done to them and either resist or at least build consciousness. But if you threaten people with the loss of love or that they'll be lonely and excluded, they will do literally anything to avoid it. It is pervasive and insidious and really, really dangerous. And I think, particularly for young people, that I think young people are very, very frightened of being, everyone is frightened of being alone or not being loved and respected. But I think that's something important to acknowledge. Um, right from you know the cosmopolitan tips on how to keep your man, I think that is just as fascistic in many ways as the here is what you do if you want to avoid getting raped, you don't walk down this street. It's uh, overt and covert threatening with cultural violence. Mm. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point. I've, I've been thinking a lot actually over the past few days of the specific language that's used, mm -hmm. as you say, to, to strip away from feminists in particular, but also women who don't identify as yeah. feminists, who are, who are perhaps feminist in theory, but are afraid mm -hmm. to associate with that word, that all of these words that are used, that um, used to dehumanize in yes. this 
in this incredibly kind of, um, it's, it's, it's like dehumanizing without being overt about the dehumanization, yeah. you know, and it, it's exactly as you say, it's withdrawing the love, it's saying that you're ugly, you're yeah. all of these things that women are, are supposedly not supposed to be, but that actually mm -hmm. when you explore at a deeper level, the, the threat of being them is really strange, like ugly, yes. you're not supposed to be ugly, fat, yeah. um, old, yeah. um, hairy, you're not supposed to, like it's an incredible threat to say to a woman, you don't like men, yes. and that's why you behave in this way. Because if you truly believed that a woman didn't like men, then what would it matter if you said that to yeah, her? Yeah, exactly. It's the, the you're ugly thing is very interesting to me, although we don't fancy you. Every day on the internet people tell me, oh, you know, you're saying all this stuff, but we wouldn't have sex with you. And I'm like, well, then my arguments are not valid. <laughs> Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. There's no more to say. It's like they, they can't. And, and, and sometimes I reply. It was like, okay, then let's never have sex. <laughs> That's fine with me. And then they had literally no comeback to this. They're like, but what? You don't. You mean you don't care if I don't fancy you or if I say you're ugly? Yet yeah. I think the idea of ugliness is very interesting because what is classified as ugly is often thoughts and behaviors as well as, uh, as, as appearance. If you get, when you get down to the meat of it, mm -hmm. anger is ugly, uh, frustration is ugly, resistance is ugly. It's, um, yeah. But you can be, the, the, the absurdity of all this is that um, you can be the most beautiful woman in yeah, the world. Classically, by, by stereotypically class beautiful. Classically, yes. stereoty stereotypically beautiful. But if you say the wrong thing, oh, or yes. if you challenge the status quo, challenge the power structures, then automatically, once again, you become someone that man A, B, or C yeah. doesn't want to have sex with. Yes. And it's incredibly, like, it relies on all of these ideas of heteronormativity mm -hmm. and um, the dominance of cisgender bodies yes. as well. And I, I really love that in your book you talk about the intersectionality as well of, in, of inclusivity yeah. with feminism. Trans politics, mm. and um, I think it's, well, uh, a lot of my very close friends, I mean, it sounds like a sop to say a lot of my friends are trans, but like most of my close friends for the past few years have been in the trans movement, and you know, I identify as genderqueer, although I didn't mm. put that in the book. Um, and I think trans politics are not just, it's not just that it's important to include that perspective in modern feminist analysis, I think it's vital. I think it's key to the analysis, the idea of challenging gender norms and that people can live outside binaries in a more active and profound and intimate way. I think that that's vital to the movement. I don't think feminism can do without trans feminism. I've noticed, um, particularly Melbourne is a very we're very fortunate in Melbourne because there is a very robust feminist movement here mm -hmm. and we can end up thinking that this is what the rest of the world is like or this is what the rest of Australia is like. And it's actually just this very mm. small kind of movement. But I've noticed a, a big kind of surge in the number of um, people who I previously had thought had identified as being women who have begun yeah. to identify as genderqueer or gender nonconforming. And I'm just wondering, as someone who has acknowledged yeah. that you're genderqueer, do you think that there is a, a link between wanting to step outside of what the, con the supposed construct of yeah. womanhood and femininity is, or is it, is it more just the openness now that we have more of these open discussions and understanding yeah. of trans and gender politics? Oh, the easy question. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a really, really tough one. And um, I can really, I can't speak for all genderqueer people here. It's, this is my personal analysis, which obviously I'm still struggling with in a lot of ways. But for me, I don't think it is possible to live outside politics. And that is not something that everyone I know in the trans movement or with trans experience agrees with. Uh, there are people who are very much not, I've always been like this, I've, I was born like this, and that, that born this way analysis is important to queer politics in general. But I have no way of knowing whether I or any other person who identifies as genderqueer today, now that we have that accepted language, would identify in that way if we lived in a gender neutral world, which is what the uh, radical feminist uh, or quote unquote radical feminist analysis is more about. Uh, when I was, I was introduced to feminism by reading Germaine Greer at a very, very young age, like uh, 11, I accidentally read uh, The Whole Woman, and there was a very transphobic analysis in Germaine Greer's writing. Um, and I think when I was young, I took that to heart, 
in a way that was um, that was probably quite damaging, saying that oh no, it's it's important to identify as a woman first. It's important to identify as you know as as your gender and to reclaim that from patriarchy. And there's always the feeling that well, you know, should you as a person, particularly as a person with passing privilege, right? I you know I'm five foot tall. I'm never probably going to pass as more as a masculine person. It's is it more important to stay and to keep identifying as female in public? Um, and for me, uh, the sorry this, if this is more complicated than oh, I. Oh no, 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 I'm, I'm writing. Essay, I'm writing an essay about this at the moment and trying to like line by line trying I'm, to piece I'm it out. I'm glad that I've yeah, asked you what you're you. writing about. This is my like it's going on in my head right now. But I think it is. One of the things that is true for both for trans women, cis women, and uh, female assigned genderqueer people, all three of those people, is that we are sexed as female by patriarchy, whether we like it or not. And one can still, like, I feel like I can still speak from a feminist point of view whilst identifying as genderqueer because ultimately, Patriarchy doesn't care how you identify. Mm. Patri- and that is the point. Patriarchy wants to put people in neat little boxes and uh, you know, make them behave in certain ways on that basis. And I think one of the things that that means is that trans politics has no option but to be radical right now, and genderqueer politics has no option but to be radical right now. And that is frustrating and challenging. Like maybe in the future, in the, in the magical future that I still believe in because I read a lot of science fiction, um, there'll be a wonderful world where we can live in Ian M. Banks's culture and we can identify however we want and it won't be an issue. But right now there is still a very radical aspect to that. And I mean, I find it exciting because I'm a political nerd. But I think some people maybe would rather just, just be. Mm. If, as much as any of us can mm. just be. Mm. Just be. Just be left alone. Yeah, just be left alone to wear an awesome suit or some nice <laughs> makeup and whatever. Yeah, and I was thinking about just slightly moving away from that. I was having a conversation with someone close to me recently about um, they have a, a son and they were talking about how they wanted... Uh, a friend of theirs had a daughter and she mm-hmm. said, I, you know, I'd really, I really want to sew dresses for your daughter. Yeah. And I said, you know what, you can sew dresses for your yeah. two-year-old son as well. I mean, he may not want to wear them, but there's a possibility that, yeah. that he might. And she was resistant to that initially, you know, saying, no, he, does, he never gravitates towards that. He never gravitates towards that. But and I said, surely but that's, that's the reason you have a kid, is to dress it up. I mean, I, come on. Yeah. I said, that's also because you have, from a very young age, you didn't say, do you want to wear the pants or do you want to wear the sparkly dress the sparkly dress and either one is okay but then later she admitted that she said I just don't feel brave enough Mm. to be the one mother that makes that statement in the circle that I move in and I think that um, I really like the way that you talk about masculinity and boyhood as well and you talk about the lost boys because I mean for my for my feminism is very much focused on uh, dismantling the patriarchy to liberate yeah. everyone yes. basically who's who's oppressed by the patriarchy. But mm-hmm. I don't focus too much on, I guess, the, yeah. the men who kind of experience privilege mm-hmm. within that. But that doesn't mean that I don't think that that conversation is important. And I think that the way that we strip the possibility of gender play yeah. from supposedly like the dominant kind of idea of mm-hmm. masculinity is really sad. It's basically, look, you can have all the treats and all the power and be part of the oppressive class as long as you give up joy and emotion. <laughs> it's, vol- it's voluntary. Except on the football field. Except on the football. Oh, rugby. It's so sad. I watch it sometimes. They're having so much fun just for that one moment where they get to kiss and cuddle each other. <laughs> and, it's really, and, like, and actually have the touch, which is not the we're not gay hug. You know the we're not gay hug? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. oh, we're not gay. <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, but it's really sad. And I think it, yeah, it's basically. It's. I. F- I think of it as like the Little Mermaid that that film where you know you can have everything but just your voice. We just want your voice, and that's mm-hmm. what men are, and boys are told. You know, you can have all the power, and you can be this uh, the hero of your own story as long as you give up that you know as mm-hmm. emotional capacity as long as you submit voluntarily to emotional castration and uh, give up the opportunity to play with gender at all mm-hmm. in any way 
And uh, it's very, I think on the scale, I don't get me wrong, like on the scale of oppression that people face, not being able to play with lipstick <laughs> is not up there in the top 10. But it does factor, right? And, you know, I have... It's part of the whole. Yeah, it's part of the whole. And, and I have, you know, a lot of male assigned friends who like to, you know, it's a, and they're just, you know, in their late 20s and early 30s, and they're just starting to go out wearing nail polish. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge deal. And, and I kind of, like, I've got all these makeup skills that I learned from, like, enforced femininity as a kid, and I'm, they're going spare. And I love teaching people how to do this stuff. It's, I mean, I'm a goth. I love it. <laughs> but um, it's really interesting seeing people struggle with that and how those tiny, intimate things can make a huge, huge difference. And then, then going out on the street. And, uh, and having people react to that is a really interesting experience. And, and I, I fully support it. I think, it, I think more guys should, should at least try, even if they're not into it. Like, mm. even, just, wear, just wear red nail polish. See what people do. Mm. It's just... It's and just eyeliner. Day. Can you all start wearing more eyeliner, please? Well, I would say, like, there are ways to wear eyeliner. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know. I'm a makeup nerd, so we can get into this. But, like, there are tutorials. I actually had to sit down and teach myself how to do eyeliner on the angles of a male-assigned face and, and blush, because I'm like, no, d you don't do it like that. You just, no, it doesn't work. No. Stop ma trying to make yourself look like a dairy maid from the 1950s. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, that, that's a uh, YouTube makeup tutorial, Laurie, for a second you got to see. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of nerds, you identify in lots of different... Yes. You've called yourself a political nerd, a sci-fi mm -hmm. nerd, um, makeup nerd. Mm -hmm. And in, in your chapter on cybersexism, yep. you talk about... Because it's, it's interesting what you say about men being... And men and boys being kind of... Um, mm -hmm. Having this negotiation of power as well that, that they have to present to and they, and they have yep. to sort of sign the contract to as well. Mm -hmm. But as you say, unfortunately, when that power structure is still there, that any perceived loss yes. of power then Absolutely. Is, is meted out to the people beneath them rather mm -hmm. than the people above. Um, and you say, this is what I want every nerd boy in my life to understand. We were there too. The other geeks and weird kids whose lives were hellish at school, who escaped into books and computers, who stayed up all night with our faces uplit by humming screens, looking for transcendence, dreaming of elsewhere, we were there too, but you didn't see us because we were girls. And the cost of being the geek with the costs of being the geek were the same for us, right down to the sexual frustration, the yearning, the being laughed at, the loneliness. And then we went online, which was supposed to be where nobody could tell you that you were a shy, specky loser with no friends, only to find ourselves slut shamed and screamed at if we gave away that we might be female. For us there was no ex escape. Well oh so and I'm, I'm sorry I don't speak quite so in person. I, I'm also incredibly jet-lagged. I'm very sorry for that. I'm not even sure if this is real. <laughs> well, I suppose I'll, I'll give you a question. <laughs> that, was, that was unfair of me just to no, throw that sorry. at you. It's okay. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> no, um, but I, I suppose it's the... I guess I want to tie that back to yeah. another quote that you have, which is about the lost boys. Mm -hmm. And um, you talk about lost boys being... This generation is lousy with lost boys, and loving them means hollowing yourself out to yep. make a space for them to crawl inside. So you do that because that's what girls are supposed to do. And I guess in the context of reading that passage and then everything that's... That, this idea that somehow what... This standard idea of what a man is is supposed yep. to be someone that has the princess at the end, that gets yes. to go on the quest. And if you're not playing that game, then you're taking something away yes, from them. Yes, absolutely. And the, uh, come, are we allowed to say Gamergate? Maybe as long as we don't say it three times, then Gamergate is a, they, <laughs> they appear like Beetlejuice in the mirror. <laughs> it's like, it's like, no. Okay, so we've said it once, it's never true. again. Um, but it's the rage that I've encountered and, and that we've seen expressed in the last couple of years online from the nerd community in particular, oh, it's fascinating for any number of reasons, particularly because uh, nerds have so much power now. We're talking about uh, tech geeks and sci-fi geeks, and there's a big crossover there, obviously. Um, the idea is that these, the, the nerd fantasy, right, the mythology, uh, and it's a, a, a white male nerd fantasy mainly, Generally, there's a token Asian male nerd, but like he's never the main character, so we don't talk about him. 
but it's the fantasy is, oh, you were bullied at school, and everything was awful, and then, you know, you save the world, you get the girl, and the modern version of that playing out in in real life is, oh, you get the tech job, you get, and suddenly you inherit the earth and the idea, but there is still that internalization of oppression. And I think that the op oppression that male, cis, white people suffer at school is real. And I don't want to minimize that. And I don't want to say like, oh, this is nothing. This is nothing. You didn't suffer anything. Because I mean, God, I was bullied at school. It was awful. It was really, really bad. But the trouble is, when you then say to those people, actually, there are people who've had it worse than you. There are people out there, and you, you maybe don't understand what privilege is and what power is, and you don't understand how to wield it, now you've got it. That has provoked some of the most vicious backlash I have ever seen in politics, that people don't want to accept that they have a responsibility to other people. They just want to have won the game and the story as they understand it. And uh, it was funny, in terms of, yeah, of media analysis, um, when Ezra Klein launched Vox um, a couple of years ago, there was a big discussion, and they've done a lot of hiring of women and minorities now, I think many of the startups have, but when all these startups came along, there was a big, like, hey, these are all white guys, and it's kind of the, the fancy new media looks kind of a lot like the old media. Um, what Ezra Klein said, and I don't have the direct quote, is, well, how can people say this about us? You know, we're the scrappy underdogs. We were, you know, the, the losers at school and we're the political nerds. And I was like, oh, that is so interesting that you still see yourselves that way and you're so rich and everybody wants to hear what you have to say and you're the least silenced people in America. It is very fascinating how that narrative of oppression is internalized. And um, I, I was recently at a, a writing course called Clarion West, the um, uh, science fiction community, and the, there's a big backlash within science fiction and fantasy and that whole nerd commu community and a huge reimagining of what storytelling can be. And there's a big battle, a cultural battle, which I mean, I think it's important because I love Doctor Who and everything like that, but I think it's generally important that there is a struggle over whose stories deserve to be told. And the fact that so many writers and creators are now coming up from different backgrounds and different aspects of society, and then they're all coming out of fan fiction, and they're all coming out of live journal, and they're coming out of all kinds of different communities. That is, and it's so, people should be so excited by that, because there are suddenly so many stories that just haven't been told in public before, but yet there is so much fear that somehow men will lose their special story, you know, their special story about how they get to win the world. But, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, well, well, where's the story where people like me get to win the world? Where's the story where the kind of overweight, specky, acne-ridden, nerdy girl gets the hot guy or the hot girl oh, and well, the fantasy, whatever? Now you're just being politically correct. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Am I politically I thought I was being horny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think that I, I, I followed, um, I'm sure you followed the, the Hugo Awards. Yes. Saga, yes. and just very, very briefly for people out there, and I'm, I'm not a big science fiction reader, so I probably, if I get this wrong, please correct me. There's a big awards, big deal in the sci-fi community called the Hugo Award. It's like the Booker Prize for nerds. And I think that people, can, people within that community can vote for the yep. winners. And there was a backlash this year exactly against what Laurie was talking about, which is the diversity that's rising up yep. in science fiction now, by two groups dominated by yep. mainly white cisgender of course we have no way of telling them no, no, we have no not. way of knowing call who they <laughs> the sad puppies and the rabid, the rabid puppies, puppies. <laughs> um and they tried to orchestrate it so that the only finalists in these awards would be the, the white guys and not the just white the white guys, guys, guys the white guys who wrote the kind of stories that they liked so no no gayness and that they no. legitimately considered to be real science fiction. Real science, because real science fiction is not all this PC nonsense about women and queers and people who aren't white and all those people who aren't totally ev almost everyone in the world. <laughs> um, it's uh, real about, you know, a guy in a space suit Saving on his own on Mars with him and the alien possibly doing some sex and saving <laughs> the Earth or the moon. Like... So they, so they organized this backlash, and, and what the, uh, the award 
the awards ended up doing was in most of these categories deciding that no award would yes. be the winner. To, to, I guess, in a really positive way. Yeah, and people voted that. for that. It wasn't just mm. the committee who decided that no award was offered as a category to vote for, and where there was nobody else on the slate, they, people voted for no award, and it was just a big, basically a big fuck you from the fans, mm. saying, no, actually, we like this trend. This is good and positive. Let it continue. Mm. But it's so interesting how, because I think that that's applicable across so many different, um, the world is changing, and mm. that's incredibly terrifying to people who actually have had a lot more power in that system than yeah. they've realised, but would, would like to believe that they exist amongst the most oppressed, because for that stereotype of the cisgender male, yeah. heterosexual white man who was bullied at school, the greatest oppression that you can experience is women not wanting to have sex with exactly, you. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and it is obviously still a huge problem for some people that they feel that they've been... Because that is the story that men are told from a very young age, is that the world owes you sex with women. And not only does the world owe you sex with women, if you don't get it, you're not a man. You're less of it. Your exactly. identity is built on getting this thing. And it is, and it's very, very hard to tell guys that there are different kinds of oppression out there, particularly as a female person who may or may not agree to have sex with mm. them after, mm. you know, it's, it's very hard for people to hear that. And it's very hard for the, you know, as a society that has developed and held on to these ideas yes. for so long, it's very hard for them to let go of the idea that emasculation is the worst thing that can happen to a man, or the the idea of what emasculation means, mm -hmm. which is to to make a man like yeah. a woman. Yes, exactly. The worst thing. I mean, in in the Orthodox Jewish faith, then which is like half of my background, you know, you wake up every day and uh, if you're a man, your prayer is, uh, thank you God for not making me a woman today. Uh, really? Yeah, well, or, for, or for not creating me a woman. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and obviously this is, it's, it's, it's a feature of religious oppression across the, I'm just, this is, this well, in a, in, a, in a fundamentalist religion, I would probably thank God for not making me yes, a woman as well. God. It's, uh, yeah. Um, in a fundamentalist In a fundamentalist one, religion. Um, I want to move on now to the to the ideas of women's sexual mm -hmm. and or female sexual um, yep. desire, and particularly your chapter about abortions and reproductive mm -hmm. health care. And you went and spent some time in Ireland yes. and spoke to um, spoke to. Uh, there's a very funny scene where you're flirting with a young pro-life <laughs> oh, Catholic bad, boy, very and. Nice. Um, really struggling with that in your head because you know that it can never end well. <laughs> but I really, I think that you've nailed it here where you say in Ireland abortion is illegal in many parts of the nominally developed world, including a great many American states, yes. safe legal termination of pregnancy is either outlawed or functionally illegal. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to say, if a woman didn't want to have sex though, abortion suddenly becomes okay. Yes. So in the idea, it's, you know, the idea of well, the I don't exception, and that's I actually have come back to this in my writing recently because the what the British government has done, among many things the British government has done lately, is it's um, it's cut tax credits for uh, women with, uh, and it's specifically linked to uh, parents with young children, but of, uh, often there's a you know direct tax on mothers with young children. Their tax credits are being cut for if they have more than two children, the tax credits for the subsequent children are cut, unless those children were born as a result of rape. Which just gets worse the more you think about it. Mm. Just, I just invite you to sit with that for five minutes and think about all the ways in which that is horrific. You know, it's punishing women for the twin sins of, you know, whorishness and poverty, mm. which of course is, is, is what you, you know, the, the nightmare female, the nightmare of the female working class, basically, is it's back to that uh, Malthusian gin lane, the overbreeding working class. Of course, you know, as I talk about in the book, there's a huge class element to misogyny mm. still. But the idea that women's sexual agency is still punished and uh, attacks on abortion rights, I believe, deeply are a, uh, are a fundamental way of punishing women for sexual agency. And obviously, you know, it is not, ev not everybody who has the capacity to bear children is female um, or identifies as female. Not everybody who identifies as female 
uh, is able or wants to bear children, but everybody is punished by that same logic. Every person within that political category is punished by that logic. Uh, punishing a female sexual agency is a huge thing today, and it is, we feel there is a myth in society right now that we are sexually liberated. And I think, in fact, there is a disconnect. There's a huge disconnect between we are able to talk about sex and we're able to have images of one kind of sexuality everywhere, but we're not actually, if we're women, we are punished for chasing pleasure or wanting pleasure of our own accord or of actually expressing any agency in that way at all. And, um, you know, it's the message we still get. It's, uh, you know, rape culture is a way of punishing women's sexual agency and personal agency. Uh, attacks on abortion rights, attacks, you know, slut shaming. Mm -hmm. It is hugely, hugely damaging to people's self-esteem. And um, I think, actually, this is one of the ways I think Germaine Greer is still incredibly relevant, because that was the bit that really spoke to me as, you know, an angsty 11 to 14-year-old when I was really, really into her writing, was like, oh, my God, somebody is finally writing about women who want to fuck. You know, I'd, I'd never heard this before, in, not in sex ed, not in anything I, I had heard. And this was, you know, 2004, and I, no, 2002. Um, I, I had heard, you know, that all the messages I had received, even from, you know, Seventeen magazine, were, you know, sex is something that men will want to do to you, and you just have to resist for as long as possible. But also, you should look like you're available for sex. Mm. And if you're not, then people will throw things at you. But you shouldn't actually have sex because then you're a slut. And there's no su suggestion that a at any point that you actually might want it. I mean, with a guy, let alone with a woman or anyone else. It's, I, I think it, it, we are still in a very Victorian world in some ways. Um, obviously, we are in a Victoria world right now. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 I still don't know where I am in, on the planet. But I think that one of, the, one of the clearest examples of that, particularly in terms of pop culture, was the treatment of any Disney princess. Oh, yes. Vanessa Hutchins, Selena Gomez, mm -hmm. anyone who has had a nude photograph stolen from yes. them and published online, mm -hmm. and then Disney has forced them to apologize to the fans. For and being naked ever. And for having a boyfriend, yeah. or for, for, for wanting as an adult person, or mm -hmm. someone at least close to adulthood, yes. to engage sexually in the same way that yeah, absolutely. other people do. Whereas for, for young men, in a way that is, is damaging in its own way, although I don't believe so much, there is this assumption that you will always be up for it. You'll always, it's, it's but some, there's this concept of sexualization. I don't know if this has been in the news here, has it? Uh, mm. The sexualization of young girls. Um, it's a very big Yeah, and this is a word news. that is, always rings alarm bells for me. Because there was this, this idea that, oh, you know, young girl, you know, growing up, loving Barbie or whatever, we let them do, and then suddenly something happens and it's boom, sexualized forever, like tainted. And you'll never get it. Well, no, actually, young women and girls are sexual beings. Mm. You know, we have sexual agency. Sex is not something that is done to us. It is, well, it shouldn't be. Yeah, well, no, exactly. It, it, it's not something that should be done as, you know, it, it, that whole idea of a sex object. But sexuality in girls especially is perceived to be owned by everyone yes. around them. Apart from them Apart themselves. Apart from them themselves. Yes. And the moment that they try and gain any agency over that. Yeah, they are punished. They're it's... punished for it. They're told that they can't, they mm -hmm. can't handle it. They're expected to be the, the gatekeepers to everyone else's yes. attempts to try and get this sex from them. Yes. And, and it's never, you know, young men at the same age are never punished for, you know, engaging sexually. The... the uh, the panic is always about teenage mothers. Well, surely the teenage fathers must have been involved in some way, mm -hmm. um, you know, one would think, um, unless there's some kind of massive virgin birth miracle going on, <laughs> which, uh, which surely Christians would celebrate. <laughs> oh, my, you know. uh, but, it, but it comes back to, you wrote an, uh, an amazing article for the New Statesman after the Steubenville case, mm -hmm. and you talked about what happened in Steubenville, Ohio, when... Yeah. Um, a group of high school football players were, were caught celebrating on video 
the mm -hmm. rape of a girl, um, the degradation and dehumanisation yep. of this girl who was unconscious and carried from party to party. I think and she it was 14 years old. At, and it was uploaded to, to the internet and she was laughed at and mocked because of course it was yep. her fault. And you called that rape culture's Abu Ghraib moment. Yep. And I think that that speaks to what you're saying, that um, even when you tie it to, to teenage mm -hmm. fathers, it still always comes back to this idea of boys will be boys and we can't punish them. And in fact, we're ruining their lives yes. here. Oh God, yeah, you can't ruin. This. Yeah, the, it's worse, like punishing people or shaming people for sexual violence is worse than actually doing sexual violence. And the discussion afterwards, after the Steubenville case, because these boys were, oh God, they were the star football players. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, we can't touch them. Um, in this small town, and they were. I think, she's ruined their yeah, lives. She's ruined their lives, not by just by speaking about it. And actually, it is uh, the the pictures mm. that came out. I mean, they were horrific. They were like she was just like totally unconscious and being passed around. And then somebody took video of people up. But the the whole the reason I use the Abu Ghraib um, image is, uh, is that the horror of the Abu Ghraib pictures was not just that these monstrosities happened. It was that somebody snapped holiday snapshots of them. It's like the, the, the fact of the picture. Somebody stood there and thought this was a fun moment to capture on camera, and somebody stood there smiling and laughing at these prisoners naked and saying, oh, isn't this a jolly time we're having in this war? And that was, that was the horror, is not just to see it being done, but to see it being accepted and celebrated. But it's, the difference... Yeah. And the difference even between that moment mm -hmm. was that uh, that was before people could upload it to yes. Facebook or Twitter. I mean, mm -hmm. these videos were created and videos post that discussing the girl and laughing at her and, yes. and calling her dead because girl. Of, yeah, dead girl. Um, were uploaded as if there was no conception that there would, that there would be any kind of problem yeah, with that. Absolutely. It, it, I actually think that it's... It's not her fault that she spoke out. It's her fault for even being there yes. in the first place. Absolutely. absolutely. And the idea that there is a big moment happening right now with the cultural discussion of rape and sexual violence, and which is ab about more than even than rape and sexual violence itself. It's about how the agency we allow female assigned people in this society and whether or not we consider women actually to be human at all. Mm. Um, and the idea that... And, and the question is whether we consider men's reputation more important than women's lives and agency. And the question has still not been decided. Um, partly because I don't think there is a social justice system, uh, uh, I'm talking about like actual criminal justice system in the world which has an adequate or even grown up understanding of consent. Um, but also because we are finally starting to talk about consent in a way that makes that is adult and equal and that terrifies the life out of a lot of people who have been raised and and kind of grown up understanding sexuality in a very different way and i think the fear is well what will for particularly for straight men the fear is well what will my sexuality be now mm -hmm. the fear of actually being yes yeah, symbolically castrated if we can't do this thing to women then how can we have sex mm -hmm. and that's a terrifying thought but it's a discussion that desperately needs to happen. And how can we perform our masculinity yeah, for each absolutely. other? Absolutely. As well, improve that. You know, if we if we have to get consent every time, then how are we ever going to get laid? Mm. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a bureaucratic nightmare. A bureaucratic nightmare. Well, that's or the worst kind tape. of nightmare. <laughs> well, um, should we go to questions? Maybe. Yeah. Yes. Have we got any? I mean, I could talk to you forever. So don't. I mean, we could, <laughs> you guys can just leave, honestly. We I do mean, have. We do have about. Um, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes for questions. So if we've got any questions in the audience, if you could just put your hands up. We do have roving microphones. Please remember to keep it short and direct and to the point and actually a question. Um, and just as, just as we're heading over there, I'll just ask you one yeah. to fill, just to fill that yeah. gap. I just wanted to touch very briefly on, just touch very briefly on class. Um, oh, yeah. Because of you, yeah. you're, my understanding is that you're a socialist mm -hmm. and obviously a lot of your writing is about class. And it was interesting to me because um, I think it was yesterday or the day before in America it was Women's Equality Day, yes. celebrating the anniversary of women, women getting the vote. But, of course, there was <laughs> lots of really important commentary about that because it was only an anniversary of white women yes. getting the vote. 
And I think that's really interesting to touch on the idea that, you know, often in feminism, and it's changing a little bit now, but in feminist arguments, we invoke this idea that women, women weren't always allowed to vote, women weren't always allowed to work. But of course, women poor have always women worked. and women of colour have always worked. And the, the only people who weren't allowed to work were middle yeah. to upper class women. And only for a very short period of time. And only if you don't consider like constant pregnancy and childbirth work, which mm. I do. Um, I have a lot of friends who are pregnant right now. And oh my God, it's, I have so much respect for that. I do want a child to dress up. But I'd like it if somebody just gave me one, so, and I could give it back. But um, yeah, the idea that, well, there's, there's two things here. One of them is the idea that the ultimate feminist liberation that we have gained is the right to be oppressed by the capitalist system in an equal way to men, while still obviously doing all the care work we've always had to do. I think that is the biggest lie of modern feminism. That's the way it's been co-opted. You know, that's our right, hooray, we have a right to, you know, earn a salary that is not enough to live on in at least London, I don't know. But the other thing, I mean, we're speaking about, we're trying to sum up intersectionality in, um, you know, very briefly here, but I think I am hugely encouraged and I learn every day from the fact that feminism is no longer the province, at least public feminism and, you know, mainstream feminism, no longer seen as the province of white, straight, middle class, women from the West who are professional writers. Having said that, I am most of those things myself. And I'm kind of aware of that in, and I was aware of that in writing this book. And it was a big kind of, I, w I kind of went through tortures over it because a book is not like the internet. On the internet, if you get something wrong, people will tell you about it. Often they will definitely tell you about it. And, and then you can go, Oh, I'm really sorry, let me go away and learn about this and let me come back and then amend this and have a conversation. And, but in a book, you can't do that. A book is a book and it's out there. And so basically what I, what I did in the end was say, look, I'm not representative. I'm not trying to represent anything. I'm, what I'm, my experience is symptomatic rather than representative. And there are a lot of other experiences out there and inevitably I'm going to get things wrong. I just need people to... to I hope that, people, that there will be a conversation. And that's, I think, what digital age politics is anyway. It has to be a conversation. Mm. So, Brilliant. can we have a conversation? Uh, who, who's got the microphone there? Hi. Uh, I have found science fiction to be a really key influence for me in developing that idea of a common humanity and, and equality. I wondered if you could tell us some of the, the key science fiction stories that oh have influenced you. Oh, yeah. Um, well, look, it's... Uh, My favorite science fiction writers in terms of feminism and in terms of thinking about a new world are Octavia Butler, uh, Ursula Le Guin. Um, at the moment, Anne Leckie is an extraordinary writer. I love Ken Liu, who just won the Hugo. Uh, well, he was the translator of, a, of the book that won the Hugo. Um, but he's also got his own novels and stories coming out now. Um, there are hugely exciting things happening. But at the same time, when I was a kid, actually, one of my favorite, one of the most important people for writing about feminist issues for me as a young kid was Terry Pratchett. I think that Terry Pratchett's women are unbelievable. And um, I was lucky enough to get to interview him before he sadly passed away um, uh, this year. But um, it's really... You know, when I was a kid growing up, I also, you know, I loved Lord of the Rings. I loved, I saw The Matrix when I was 13, come on. You know, I, I dressed like Trinity at every Halloween for, <laughs> from then until like now, actually. I still, and now I've left school, I get to dress that way every day. So, <laughs> um, but, and I, if, I don't know if anybody's read The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow. Um, Juno Diaz, incredibly important writer. Um, he describes in that book better, I think, than anyone else the sensation of, well, he describes reading Lord of the Rings, or a young Dominican kid reading Lord of the Rings, and getting to the bit where the dark-skinned men from the south come to help Sauron, and just, who is the evil guy for anybody out there who's not read, I don't know, has anybody not, whatever. Um, like, it's, uh, and then just, just, 
skipping that page mm. because it was too painful and having that jolt you out of the fantasy when you understand that actually this is not for you. This is not for you. And for me, this was like, oh, lady hobbits don't get to go to the Shire. They just stay at home and wait for Sam to come home and marry them. That's the one <laughs> lady hobbit in that entire book. Also, uh, Vir Vita Virginia Sackville Baggins, or whatever her name is, the awful one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really that seeing that and understanding that I wasn't part of that story was I think part of as much a part of the influence as anything else and I, I really am enthused by how that is changing now. Hunger Games, woo! Mm. Hunger Games. Anyone else? Next question. The dude here at the back. Um, hello. Hi. Um, nice accent by the way. Um, <laughs> you too. <laughs> cheers. I wanted to ask you the, the sort of hope question. So where do you see um, like the shimmers of light coming through in terms of change, uh, in your opinion? Oh, God, um, hugely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I was at a event in Germany a couple of months ago, and a, a girl had a tattoo on her wrist in Arabic that said, hope is the last thing to die. And I sort of want to copy that tattoo, men, because I never have any original ideas for tattoos. Mm -hmm. But um, the, I think hope is something that you work for. Um, a writer friend of mine says that hope is, hope is the people who, like, who got on the lifeboats out of the Titanic and swam, not because they knew that somebody was coming to rescue them, but because they knew that they wouldn't survive if they didn't take that chance. Um, there are a lot of really dark things happening in the world today, in the political system, in the environment. There is a lot of backlash, and I think hope is something that we work towards and build. It's not something that we wait around to feel. It's an active thing. It's not like a fe Having said that, um, I get emails occasionally, and, and I got one this morning, which was, like, amazing, uh, from young people, often young women, uh, young queer people, young men saying like, just like telling me their life story and telling me their politics and I, I feel like the, I don't know even if it's a generation below us, I think it's almost like the cohort below us that have, um, that have come up in this digital age and have not been fooled by neoliberalism in the way that the pre-2008 generation was, I think they are the future in many ways. They are, well, obviously, they're, they're literally the future, but they're, <laughs> they're, I don't want to be all like singing Michael Jackson or whatever, but uh, although a good singer. But um, we, yeah, um, it's, I'm really, really enthused by how many resources young people have now, how smart they are, and how motivated and dedicated and political they seem to be. And maybe I'm, I've got a, obviously, there's selection bias, but I think even if like a fraction of the few people who write to me go on to maintain those politics, I'm really super hopeful, basically. Um, there was a, um, a, a, an analogy that I thought of, because I, I agree with you actually, I think that a lot of young people are embracing politics in a mm -hmm. way that uh, they're often disenfranchised by the way that they're engaging yes. with politics because people can't see Particularly when people talk about young women and feminism, oh, they're silent, they're not engaged. That's because people don't read Tumblr. Yeah. <laughs> yes, know? exactly. What is um, this internet? <laughs> Can you print it out for me? But I also, think, I also think that change across all spectrums, whether, you know, people like to dig their heels in and say that, say that um, change isn't possible, that this is human nature, mm -hmm. that uh, we can't do anything different. But actually, when you think of it in terms of, of how we got smoking out of restaurants, <laughs> and at the time, people were like, you can't take cigarettes out of restaurants. No one will stand for not being able to smoke at yeah. the restaurant. And then, of course, that was fine. And then it was like, we can't take cigarettes out of pubs. No one will go to the pub if they can't have a cigarette. Yes. And, of course, now, if you went into a restaurant or a pub, certainly in it Australia... It would be really but, weird to... And you, well, it wouldn't just be weird. People would look at you with disgust. How could you, how could you light up a cigarette here? We almost need to just be so unrelenting with the the belief that these things must change. Creating cultural change is incredibly important and I think powerful and that's one of the ways that uh, people are disenfranchised from the 
the mainstream political process, but creating cultural change is how it happens. It's how it happened in the LGBT rights movement that's happening. Obviously, there is still a huge way to go. I'm not one of the people who believes that, yay, as soon as we can get married, it'll be fine. You know? Yay, we give uh, gay people the same right to ruin their lives as straight people. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I don't. Well, I slightly mean it. But um, it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, then it's all over. But the, you know, it's relentless pushing for cultural change. When you think about what the queer movement has had to overcome in terms of you know just getting onto the mainstream and then AIDS, which decimated a community and and you know created so much hostility, and um, overcoming those, it's it's been a culture war as well as uh, as much as a war about political milestones. And I think that's what it's going to be for gender, and it's what it's going to be for all kinds of intersectional and social justice politics. Mm -hmm. When did you um, first act on your feminism in school, or did you at all? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I will return that to you afterwards. If you <laughs> actually, when I was nine years old, I started a petition for girls to be allowed to wear trousers in my school, which was not allowed. And um, uh, there was a backlash petition from the boys in my year uh, to so girls would be allowed to wear nothing at school, which was very bad and very mean. But we did nearly win. And we went out and drew a big pair of trousers on the gravel pit in school, which we thought was terribly radical at the time. <laughs> what about you? I mean, I presume you're in school or? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually school wearing right my now. school uniform at the moment. Oh, cool. But um, at my school, we actually got in trouble for wearing, we have tracky dacks for um, our sport uniform. Do you know what tracky dacks are? Job track suit pants. pants. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they're track pants, sorry. You probably don't know what those are. But um, at my school, we got a lot of us got in trouble because like, a bunch of the girls started wearing the school uniform that the boys wore and tracky dacks. And we're allowed to wear actual pants, but we're not allowed to wear tracksuit pants, which is really weird. And all what? the boys wear shorts and stuff, but the girls all have dresses, which are really cold. We're not allowed to wear anything underneath them either. And we just get like really cold. And I wear a, the dress, a jumper, and this at the same time, and I still get cold. Yeah. So it's quite annoying. That's basically fascism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awful. You should start a petition. But if you start a petition now, it will get shared all over the internet and you'll probably win, which we did not. <laughs> so, yes. Thank but you'll you. still be able to draw a pair of pants yes. in the gravel driveway. <laughs> um, we've got time for one last very quick question. The back up there, I've been waving his hand for a while. Um, and after this, of course, Laurie will be signing her books stuff. in the foyer, so you can have a chance to speak to her yeah. then. Hi. Um, thanks for an awesome talk, by the way. That was yeah. really fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask a question, but probably touches us on your talk on Sunday, but I didn't get a ticket, so I thought I might try it here, um, which is on work. Um, there's an article I'll tweet up for anyone else's reference, but an article in The Atlantic that was talking about machine learning and automation basically replacing 47% of jobs in the next uh, coming decades. So jobs are just basically going to fall by the wayside. And one of the interesting things that came from that was uh, that uh, the gender disparity and those that were uh, considered precarious was mm. that a bunch of men were going to have jobs that were going to be automated out yeah. of existence, whereas women tend to have jobs that were more safe because they had more networking roles mm. that you couldn't automate particularly well. Um, not to say that uh, one's job is gender essentialist, yeah, yeah. but uh, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, I. How long have we got? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, tons. Uh, automation is a really is a it's been a huge thing for a for many generations. Uh, increasing automation of work and labour. I would, I mean, as a socialist, and and I mean, I, I define as a socialist or an anarchist, depending on what kind of particular thing we're talking about. But I don't believe that wage labor can be sustained as a way of uh, organizing human society for very much longer. I mean, it's already breaking, right? Which is where things like the Wages for Housework campaign, or the 70s and 80s feminist Wages for Housework campaign, is interesting because it turned out not to be 
it's posing the question of wages for housework and what work is remunerated and unremunerated because the, I mean the jobs that you're talking about that women do are or women are expected to do are either underpaid or unpaid you're talking about the jobs that the jobs that can't be automated are the jobs that involve emotional labor and care work of any kind, whether that's raising kids, having kids, or the emotional labor of, uh, of care work, or of just you know, working at a coffee shop and having that smile, working in customer relations and making people feel good. That's work that women are meant to do. We do the work of making f people feel good in society and being nice to each other. And that's, I think it's, it's massively important that that is considered labor and that is considered valuable work within our societies, but also um, I work is uh, fundamentally a broken concept and uh, we can go into that if you like, but I think that's a whole different talk, honestly. It's, uh, but yeah, like. And it will be a whole different talk it will be a whole this different Sunday. Talk. Yes, um, and we'll be of, back. <laughs> some, of you, some of you may have tickets to that talk. Uh, that is unfortunately all that we have time for tonight. And I honestly, I know people say this all the time, but I really do feel like I could sit here and pick your yeah, brain for another right. three hours. Yeah. So thank you all so much for coming. Please give Laurie Penny a thank huge round of applause. An incredible thinker, speaker. I'm just stunned thank at you. how stupid you make me feel. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming and supporting the Melbourne Writers Festival. Mary will be signing books in the foyer. Please do continue to enjoy this, the last weekend of the festival. And enjoy your weekend. <laughs> <laughs>